We're going to continue on here still. Chapter 14. We're at least on the downhill here of chapter 14. Uh, so last time we got into really, as I, I mentioned, sort of the uh, kind of important part of the class. Uh, again, the kind of difficult part of the class for a lot of students. Uh, we're going to get into here, obviously, buffers. And we're going to talk about titrations for the rest of this chapter here. And again, it really is where all those sort of conceptual understanding of what's going on is really important uh, for you to obviously do the math part correctly. There's a lot of places where, uh, again, you could do a lot of math that you should not do because that's not really what's happening in the problem. Uh, so you got to really kind of think about, you know, conceptually what's happening in these sort of problems to make sure that you do apply the math correctly. The good news is for most part we've done most of the math that you would have to do again just understanding how you should apply it and when you should apply it is really the most important thing so last time towards the end after we talked about polyprotic acids uh, we really delved into the idea of the common ion effect and the common ion effect is really as we'll talk about and continue to talk about here today really what's happening in a buffer situation and in a common ion effect, what we have is a common ion that will suppress the ionization of a weak acid or a base or a weak base. So if you had something like hydrofluoric acid, which is a weak acid, it normally would, in solution, break apart into H plus and F minus here. Remember that it is a weak acid and a weak electrolyte, which means in solution, you really do have HF mainly there, uh, but you do have some of these guys being produced. And that is why, obviously, uh, it is considered still an acid. It still has the ability here to produce some H plus in solution, uh, but it will mainly stay here together. Now, if we took something like hydrofluoric acid and we added some sodium fluoride to it, sodium fluoride being a strong electrolyte will 100% break apart into sodium ion in solution and fluoride ion in solution. So if we were to take both of these guys really and sort of dump it into a beaker, Got that on discount. It's an oddly shaped beaker there. <laughs> Hopefully it didn't break. <laughs> All right. So if we dump both of these really into this beaker here, uh, really only one of them will set up an equilibrium and it's going to be that weak acid. So in solution it is really just going to be the weak acid here that's going to set up the equilibrium. And what that's going to do is basically keep all those ions in solution. Now, when I put the sodium fluoride in, it is the fluoride here and also the sodium that's gonna go for it to swim. But really a sodium is just a spectator ion. The common ion is going to be, be basically the fluoride. It's basically here the sodium fluoride is going to act as a really source of F minus in this example. The result of that is, as we talked about last time, based on Lachat Layer's principle, what's going to happen is now that we've increased our product side here with our F minus, that is going to cause the equilibrium to shift even more here back to the left hand side. It's going to shift away from where we added it to. The result of that is you're going to actually have a lot more of the HF in that solution, a lot less of the H plus is going to be able to come off because of that shift in equilibrium. We did a calculation, I think, uh, with maybe acetic acid and sodium acetate. And the result of this is what we will see in a common ion situation is the concentration of H plus will go down. The result of that is we will see an actual sort of increase, if you will, in the pH of that solution that has the common ion uh, versus the solution that does not have the common ion. So in comparison, those two, in this case, just the weak acid uh, to the solution with the weak acid and a common ion, uh, we will see a kind of higher pH. doesn't mean it will be basic or anything like that, uh, but it does mean it will be higher than sort of just the acid by itself because of that effect that's happening. So really what these are, 
our um, buffer type problems and buffers are really common ions. Uh, it has a weak acid and conjugate base or a weak base and conjugate acid. They're both in that solution together. The other sort of thing that we saw was when we did the calculation, because of this Le Chatelier's principle sort of effect here that's happening and keeping this acid together, the end result of what you start with in terms of your ice table and sort of what you end with in terms of your ice table, uh, those concentrations are relatively the same in each of those cases. And because they are relatively the same, that means that you could use an ice table or you could use the henderson hasselbach equation. I think that we talked about last time as well. A couple of things on both of those things. So really in these sort of common ion situations or really buffer situations, you have really two options in terms of how to sort of get to the pH. You absolutely could just do a regular ice table like we've done many times up to this point. The key, as we talked about, when you do an ice table in a buffer or common ion situation, which is pretty much the same, the really important thing is you should have an initial concentration here. This would be zero. And the thing, again, that most people will miss when they do the ice table is the common ion will be supplied uh, by that other sort of solution that you put in there. In the case of my example, we would have an initial concentration, bless you, uh, that would be coming from the sodium fluoride in my example. So if you put a zero there on the right-hand side, you are not really doing a buffer problem or a common ion problem. You're basically just doing the weak acid problem. So you won't get the right answer. So that's a really important thing if you choose to do an ice table, which is perfectly fine. But that is a very, very common error that a lot of people make. Uh, the rest of the ice table is like normal here. And um, when we uh, do solve for... X, it will equal our H plus concentration. And then obviously we could go right into our pH equation at that point. So in a common ion or buffer type situation, that is one option and sort of one approach that you could take to calculate the pH of a common ion or buffer type solution. The other approach is, as we talked about, you could use the henderson hasselbach equation, uh, which is the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the base over the acid where the pKa value is equal to minus the log of the Ka. So if you recognize that it is a common ion or buffer problem, you could go directly into this equation uh, without having to do the ice table. And that would obviously give you the exact same answer regardless of which way you go. So it really is a personal preference as to which way you go. Probably the henderson hasselbach equation would be quicker. It also might be a little as you're maybe doing an ice table. Um, but either one should give you the same. Uh, we also talked about that there are another sort of version, if you will, of the henderson hasselbach equation. And this equation uh, deals with pOH rather than pH. So sometimes you will see people use pOH is equal to the pKb plus the log of the acid over the base. So these guys are flipped as well. And it's a pKb value here. PKB is equal to minus the log of the KB value. And the relationship between PKA and PKB is if you take the uh, PKA plus the PKB, uh, it equals 14, kind of like the POH plus the PH equals 14. Pretty much the same deal. Uh, so that's also a very convenient way uh, if you maybe only could find a PKB value, but need a PKA value, you could get to it really quickly by just subtracting 14. Um, I think I might have mentioned it last time. Personally, I would invest your time into these two because I would say probably in most cases, uh, you're going to be asked for the pH anyways. So you might as well just calculate the pH directly rather than calculating the POH and having to subtract it, but it does work either way. You definitely can use the henderson hasselbach equation for any type of buffer situation or um, common ion situation, it, be it acidic, basic, or neutral conditions. It doesn't matter. It works perfectly fine as long as you have basically two things that you make sure of. You're using the pKa value in that equation, and you have the base on top and the acid on the bottom. Typically speaking, the acid has one more H than the base when you're trying to figure out which one's which. That is typically sort of how you can figure it out. 
Any questions on that stuff there that we talked about last time here? Yeah. No, Ka Ka means acid, basically. So it's whenever you have H plus or H3O plus, that should be a Ka. Uh, Kb is basically base, is what the B kind of stands for. So uh, it's whenever you produce OH minus is when you should use that. So again, as we talked about, I think last time as well, or a couple of times ago as well, um, that is really how you make that sort of determination. And we see it a lot with hydrolysis type stuff we've been doing in the lab. Uh, again, it's really on the product side that kind of determines, you know, which one you should be using. If you have uh, H plus or H3O plus, Ka definitely should be what should be used. And if on the product side you see OH minus, uh, then definitely the Kb value should be used in that situation. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. So I think we uh, finished with just an example last time, right? Maybe the formate example, I think. So I think we're at this slide, if I'm not mistaken, right? So let us then talk officially about buffers. We've been sort of alluding to buffers. And really a buffer solution is a really common ion situation that's occurring. And a buffer is really made up of uh, really a combination of two things. You could either have a, as it says there, a weak acid and the salt of his conjugate base. The salt just means that it has like a spectator ion that's really not doing anything like a sodium, a potassium, you know, something like that, lithium. Or you can make a buffer out of a weak base and the salt of his conjugate acid. they both need to be in solution to begin with. And that is really why it has to be a weak acid and this conjugate base or a weak base and this conjugate base acid. You cannot have a buffer that is from, all right, made up of, I guess is a better way to say that, made up of a strong acid are a strong base. So you cannot have a buffer that's made up of a strong acid or a strong base. And it's really for this reason. As it says here, they both have to be present in the solution in order for a buffer to work correctly. So for example, if I took something like hydrofluoric acid, like we were just talking about there, and a solution that has sodium fluoride in it, this is a weak acid. And this is his conjugate base. This is really the salt of his conjugate base because frankly, there is a sodium there. The actual buffer part is not the sodium, it is actually the F minus part. It is actually the, the buffer part of this. It's really the HF and the F minus. The relationship between these two things is a difference of one H plus, like we talked about with Bronsted, Lowry, acid, base, conjugate, base pairs. That's how you can know if these things can be a buffer is they need to be related to each other by that kind of Bronsted, Lowry definition of just one H plus difference between them. And they do need to be weak. So when we have something like HF and sodium fluoride as sort of our weak acid and salt of its conjugate base, what happens in solution is that hydrofluoric acid, as I drew on the last one there, will be able to set up an equilibrium where it will be able to keep in solution both parts of that buffer that's needed. It's basically the acid part and the base part of the buffer. And in this case, we're actually going to have a little bit more of that F minus than we normally would because we're going to add some sodium fluoride to it. So we got to kind of beef up the F minus part of the buffer in there. But that allows both of those things to be in the solution to begin with. And that's really important for how a buffer is able to function.
Why we can't do that with like a strong acid, for example, is when I put a strong acid, like say hydrochloric acid, and I want to make it a hydrochloric acid and sodium chloride. They are related to each other, right? We have HCl and Cl minus. The difference is one H plus between them. The problem though is hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, which means when it goes for a swim, it is going to 100% break apart into H plus and Cl minus, right? We got H plus and Cl minus. You have a little bit more Cl minus from the sodium chloride. You have some sodium ions in there, which is not doing much. That's neutral, so it's not doing much. So really what you would have in this situation is because that is a strong acid, it cannot set up the equilibrium. And really the only thing that you would have in that solution is kind of like the conjugate base. You would have none of the acid parts still in the solution. And that is why a strong acid or strong base cannot be a buffer uh, because it's not able to keep both the acid part of the buffer in the solution and the base part in the buffer solution. You'll just have one or the other and it will not be able to function correctly. Yep. Yeah, because HCl, if we look at like we wanted to make a buffer with HCl or sodium chloride together, right? Just like we dumped HF and sodium fluoride in there. If we dump both of those things in there, they're actually both strong electrolytes. So sodium chloride is a strong electrolyte and so is hydrochloric acid because it's a strong acid, which means we basically just have ions floating around. And in this case, the ions that we'd have floating around, uh, we would have some H plus, which is okay because every solution will have some H plus in it. But we'll basically have just a Cl minus floating around, both from the strong acid and also sodium chloride here. So we have a lot of the base part, if you will, of the buffer, uh, but we have no acid part still there. So, and that's not going to allow the buffer to work really well. So you cannot have a buffer that is made up of a strong acid or a strong base. We will talk about it a little bit later, and in lab we'll also talk about it as well. But uh, you can make a buffer from the reaction of a strong acid or strong base with either a weak acid or weak base. But the buffer itself is not the reacting part, it is what is done at the end. At the end, you don't longer have the strong acid or strong base there, but you're left with a buffer at the end. And so you can definitely make a, a buffer from that reaction of a strong acid and strong, a strong acid and a weak base, uh, but you will not have the buffer until the very end of that reaction and no strong acid or strong base would remain. So if we took, you know, for example, if we took uh, like, hey, HF plus some sodium hydroxide, right? So this is a weak acid and a strong base. And it will react and make some sodium fluoride and some water in this case, right? Now, this reaction here is not a buffer, but what would happen if you went through like an ice table, for example, and we'll do it later on in this chapter, next chapter. What would happen is if you do it correctly, all the sodium hydroxide will be gone but you will be left with this HF and this sodium fluoride left over at the end. And it's at that point that you would have made a buffer. So as we'll talk about again a little bit later, you can make one, but the strong acid, strong base is not the buffer part of it, but it can generate a buffer as a result of a reaction. And we'll talk obviously about that a little bit later on. We'll see it happen a lot in titrations. You actually see it happen. Uh, and we'll see that that will occur down the road here. All right, well, let's get back to really a buffer and really what it is and sort of how it, it sort of works. A buffer, first off, a lot of people have a very misconception about a buffer. A lot of people think that a buffer is a neutral solution. And that is true. A buffer can be a neutral solution, but it could also be an acidic solution. It could also be a basic solution. You can make a buffer, frankly, at any pH you like. As an example of that, today we took the yellow, the pink, and the blue solutions. Those were buffered solutions at a buffer of four, which is acidic, seven, which is base, uh, neutral, and uh, blue, which is basic, so with 10. So you could absolutely make a buffer at any pH you want, so it's not necessarily always a neutral solution. What it is, though, it is a solution that will be able to maintain its pH, 
even if you add some more acid or more base to it. And because it has those two parts, an acid part and a base part, it's able to really handle more acid or more base and maintain its pH. So first misconception, buffer always neutral. It is just whatever pH it starts at, it will be able to really maintain it. Will it maintain it exactly where it started if you add acid or base to it? The answer is no, it will go down a little bit. Maybe if you add some acid, pH will go up a little bit if you add some base. But what you will not see is a giant jump in pH. So for example, if you started with a buffer at a pH of five and you add acid to it, it should stay around a pH of five. Maybe it drops to 4.92, 4.93, five, something like that. Uh, but you would not see the pH go from a pH of five all the way down like a pH of one if you added it, right? And it's able to resist that change. Same thing if we started with that buffer at a pH of five, you add some base to it, you will see a gradual change depending on how much you added. It will go up a little bit. Maybe it goes up to 5.08, 5.1, something like that. But you won't see the buffer go from a pH of five all the way up to like a pH of 12 if you add base to it, if it is functioning correctly. And the way it's able to do that, again, as I mentioned, is there's really that acid part of the buffer and the base part of the buffer. So let's look at actually the action here of buffers and how we get there. So let's first look at a situation where it is not a buffer. So if we take water, which is a non-buffer situation, and if we take some hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, and add it to water, so if we take some hydrochloric acid and we add it to water, because hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, it is going to, again, 100% break apart into H plus and Cl minus. So once again, in that beaker, you basically just have a bunch of H pluses and Cl minus is floating around. 100% of what you got going on is those ions. <clears throat> This is really important because if we think about the pH, the pH is equal to minus the log of the H plus. So when I dump my HCl into this water, I just generated a bunch of H plus really quickly. So the concentration of H plus went up. That also means concentration of OH minus went down. And because the concentration of H plus went up a lot here, we would expect the pH to go up a lot. Yeah, we would expect a big, uh, sorry, wrong way. We would expect a decrease in the pH. <laughs> My arrow going the wrong direction. <laughs> we would expect a, a big decrease in the pH here as we added more acid, right? Uh, so in this case, maybe our water by the way, the pH of water, maybe about five and change or something. If you, oh, we'll say we have pure water. So we'll say a pH of seven. And maybe it goes from seven all the way down to like pH of two, right? A really big jump in pH because we have a lot of H plus that has been made really, really quickly. So this obviously would not be a buffer because of this. Now, if we took some sodium hydroxide and also added it to water, Sodium hydroxide being a strong base in this case. And when we add it to water, it also will 100% break apart into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. So in our beaker here, we basically just made a bunch of sodium ions, but we also made a bunch of hydroxide ions happening here. So by dumping the sodium hydroxide into water, which is not a buffer, we have just increased the hydroxide concentration. By default, that means the H plus concentration went down. And that means in this case, the pH will go up. So we are producing a lot of free hydroxide. And again, 100% of what you got going on there is those ions. None of it's gonna stay together. And we would again expect here a pretty big jump in the pH because we basically just introduced a bunch of hydroxide really quickly to our solution. And that's gonna make our pH, for example, if we started at seven, maybe jump up to 10 or 11, you know, a really big jump in pH. 
So in the case here of a non-buffer situation like water, it cannot handle the addition of that H plus to the solution or the OH minus to the solution, and it's going to create a little havoc in terms of the pH. First off, any questions on the non-buffer situation here? All right, so let's look at a buffer and what would happen if we added these things to a buffer. And we'll just use a different sort of situation since we've been using HF, why not? We'll use HF and we'll say we made a buffer out of these two things here and some sodium fluoride. This once again is our weak acid and the conjugate base. And again, even though it's sodium fluoride, the sodium is just a spectator ion. It's really not doing anything. The sort of buffer part of it, again, here is really the F minus part. So we have HF and F minus, which again is that relationship of one H plus difference. And we really have, again, an acid part and a base part in the solution. So in this solution, it is going to, as I drew before, able to set up this equilibrium. And again, we have that acid part in the solution and the base part in the solution. So now if I take that same acid that I put in there before, and I decided to add some HCl to this solution, I'm going to get a reaction between HCl, which is a strong acid. When I dump HCl in here, and it goes for a swim, it is going to react with what thing? Will it react with the acid part of the buffer or the base part of the buffer? These reactions are called acid, what type of reactions? Acid, base reactions. Yeah, they're not called acid, acid, or base, base. Kind of just sounds funny, right? So when you dump this strong acid into the solution, it is going to go and really and react with the base part of the solution, which is our buffer. And we will get this reaction. And again, if you want to leave the sodium fluoride, you can. Or it's really the F minus part. This is going to do a double displacement reaction, right? Positive, negative, positive, negative. So we're going to get a switcheroo that's going to happen here. And the result of this is we will end up with HF being formed. And we'll resolve a little sodium chloride action. So by adding this to our buffer instead of water, we actually get this reaction that occurs. And this is really important. Let's take a look at what we made. So in this particular case, we made more HF. HF was part of the buffer to begin with, right? So we actually just increased this guy in that solution, right? We made more of this guy. Now, the other thing that we made was a salt here. And the salt is sodium chloride. So with your advanced salt skills, right? You're going to tell me sodium chloride is what type of salts? It is a neutral salt. I think I heard somebody say that, so that's good. That is a neutral salt, right? That is a sodium ion, which is group one, which is neutral, and Cl minus comes from HCl, which is a strong acid, which means it will be relatively weak and neutral as well. So we made a neutral salt, and we made part of the buffer that was there originally, and that always happens. You always actually make part of the buffer when you use part of it. So in a buffer sort of reaction, you use up, in this case, some of the base part of the buffer, but you actually regenerate a little bit of the acid part in this case. It is actually what we do not see here. That is really important. So what do we not see here that we did see when we added the HCl to water? What is not in that equation that is in the equation for it when the acid when it was added to water that would affect the pH. Yeah, and what ions particularly is important here. What affects the pH? Yeah, so when we added the HCl to water, we made a bunch of H plus, right? Which has a really big effect on the pH. When we added that same 
acid to here. There is no free H plus formed. So we don't actually see that H plus being formed. And what that means is the amount of H plus that was there originally will remain relatively constant. So because no new H plus was formed, the concentration of H plus stays relatively constant. And if the H plus concentration stays relatively constant, that means pH should also stay relatively constant as well, because the H plus concentration is not going crazy at this point. It pretty much is hanging out around where it started at, right? Um, it will change a little bit. So you will see that pH come down a little bit but you won't create as much H plus as you did with that non-buffer situation that you'll see a really big jump in pH. We obviously are making some more HF that will kind of break apart a little bit, right? And make a little bit more H plus. And that's why we see a slight decrease in the pH and not a big jump. So when we add that strong acid to this buffer, because there's a base part to this buffer, uh, which in this case is our HF, right? it is able to prevent the formation of free H plus and thus keep the pH relatively about where it's at. Any questions on that there? So let's talk about what happens when we add the sodium hydroxide here to the same buffer. So if we added our sodium hydroxide to our same buffer, so same idea here, we have our buffer that is set up with our HF, our H plus and F minus. And in this case, we're gonna add some sodium hydroxide to it. When we add the sodium hydroxide to this buffer, it should react with what thing? Should react with the acid part of the buffer, which is HF. So we're going to get a reaction, in this case, between sodium hydroxide and the acid part of the buffer, which in this case is HF. This is going to do a normal acid-base reaction, which you make water and a salt, also a double displacement reaction, positive guys switch partners to make water and our salt in this case, which is sodium fluoride. So in this particular case, we see that we made water, which obviously would not affect the pH. It's like we saw above, in this case, we actually made some sodium fluoride, which is the other part of the buffer. Uh, so we actually increased the amount of sodium fluoride in this example, uh, which again, it always happens in a buffer situation. Once again, you kind of use one part of it and make the other part. So as one goes down, the other part of the buffer kind of goes up. So once again, that sodium fluoride, which was there to start with, should not mess up the pH. Water obviously should not mess up the pH. And once again, it is what we do not see that we did see here. What did we see here that was important? When we added the sodium hydroxide to water, we saw a bunch of OH minus being formed. And in the reaction with the buffer, we get no free OH minus being formed. And that's really important because as we've been talking about H plus and OH minus, their concentrations are pretty much tied to one another. So if the concentration of OH minus stays relatively constant, that means that the concentration of H plus will also stay relatively constant. Remember, as one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. So if one stays constant, the other will stay constant. And that will keep our pH again, relatively constant here. Will you see it move a little bit? You will, you'll see it again, come up a little bit, but because we're not generating a ton of OH minus all at once, uh, we will not see that really big jump in pH, but maybe it goes up a little bit as you're adding the base. Yes. Uh, where it says after, which word now? I'm sorry. Very important. PA stays relatively constant. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're talking about? All right. Above that, the OH concentration is relatively constant. The H plus concentration is also relatively constant as well. And both of those being relatively constant, 
And again, I say relatively constant because there will be a little bit of movement in those concentrations, but not big, big changes in those concentrations that we see a really big jump in the pH up or down. And that's how it's able to do it. Question on either of that there. <clears throat> So the way a buffer is able to function is because it has an acid part and because it has a base part, it is able to prevent when you take some acid or base and put it into a buffer, it's able to prevent the formation of free H plus or free OH minus. And by preventing more of those H plus or OH minus from being formed, it's able to keep those concentrations constant and also keeps our pH from going crazy and relatively constant as well. So sometimes you could think of a buffer sort of like this, you know, you have, if this is sort of our buffer, and it has again, an acid part and a base part. And when we add additional acid to it, it is going to react with the base part, but it will make some more of the acid part. So dramatic we drawn here. We will make more of the acid part, but we'll use up some of the base part here. Not drawn to scale in this case, if this is still our buffer. And if we uh, add some base, we will use up the acid part of the buffer, but we will make more of the base part of the buffer. So you can think about it as a buffer is sort of working, you're sort of using part of it, but you are sort of regenerating the other part of the buffer. So you're kind of like going up and down depending on what you're adding. Now there is something known as buffer capacity. What happens if I didn't read instructions, which I'm sure nobody would ever do. And I grab the wrong thing off the shelf. Like I grab the say 18 molar hydrochloric acid, instead of like the 0.1 molar. Could happen, it seems very similar, I suppose, right? Besides the fact that you'd be choking and the tester would get really hard and you dump it into your buffer, right? So let's just say I added like way too much acid, too strong of an acid, too much volume of an acid. What would happen in that situation if I added like way too much acid? As I continue to add acid, I am basically going to continue to do what to my buffer? I'm gonna to continue to, chew up right the base part of the buffer right this part will keep growing this part will keep getting chewed up chewed up until some point you chew up all of your buffers kind of like blowing through your buffer right and now if that doesn't stop you at that point and you know, like i still got like 30 gallons of acid why not we'll just keep dumping it in once you blow through your buffer and you keep adding that acid what's going to happen it is because now all you're doing is dumping in a bunch of H plus right at that point that there's nothing in that solution anymore to stop it from forming. And as you correctly said, you would see a big jump right in the pH coming down. Same thing would happen if you added too much base or continue to add base, added too strong of a base, you could blow through your acid part of your buffer, right? And at that point, you would just continuously add OH minus to it and you would see a really big jump in the pH at that point, it would go up. It is basically what happens and we'll see it and we'll talk about when we do titrations, but if you've ever done a titration before and you add just one drop, right? And your thing went from colorless to like super pink, you blew right through your buffer basically is what happened there and you had a really big jump in pH. And that's why it went so dark pink on you when you did your titration. We'll talk more about that when we get to a titration. Uh, but that's kind of a similar situation. So there is a limit to buffers. Uh, when you make a buffer, and we're going into the buffer experiment, I think coming up next on Thursday, we're starting it. Uh, when you make buffers, you do want to make a buffer that is sort of the correct molarity, if you will, uh, to react with the acid or base that you may be adding. Um, and again, it's about really the moles of your buffer and stuff like that. How do you know how to make a proper buffer? Like, how do you pick, like, you know, what I should make my buffer out of? We actually can use the Henderson Hasselbach equation uh, to sort of help us understand how you should choose a proper buffer. And if we look at the Henderson Hasselbach equation, which is really the equation that is 
strictly used for buffers, which are common ion situations. And I think as we've talked about as well last time, uh, you should only use the henderson hasselbach in a buffer situation, uh, which is a common ion situation. You should never use it in any other situation. Um, <clears throat> if I make a buffer like I did here, where essentially I have equal concentrations of my acid part of the buffer and the base part of the buffer, which is really good, right? Because you kind of want a pretty good amount of each of those in the solution to begin with. That basically means when I take this, the pH would equal the pKa plus the log of, if this number and this number is the same, that's the log of one, right? And the log of one equals zero, yeah? Which means if you are trying to choose what to make your buffer from, you would look for an acid, a weak acid or a weak base that has a pKa value, usually plus or minus one of your desired pH. So for example, if I was to make a buffer that is, uh, that I wanted to make say a buffer of four-ish or so like that with the pH of four, a really crappy choice to make the buffer would be something like what you were using for your salt, like ammonia and ammonium chloride, right? That is basically a buffer that can be made. The Ka value is like 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10, which if I grab a calculator, got one somewhere, oh, there we go. If I take that and do minus the log of say 5.6 to the minus 10, that is a pKa value of about 9.25. So if I wanted to make a buffer at a pH of say 4.2, that would be a really terrible choice. I would have to do a lot of work to get it down there. Now, if I took something like everybody's favorite example, which is acetic acid, Ka value 1.8 times 10 to the minus five gives you a pKa value of 4.74. That would be a much better choice to choose. There could even be one that's a better choice than that, but out of those two, that would be the much better choice. It is much closer to your desired pH than say ammonia, which has obviously a pKa value of 9.25. That's way too far. So part of what we'll do in that experiment that's coming up is you will have to choose sort of a correct sort of combination to make your buffer out of. And you wanna look at again, uh, something where your pKa value is plus or minus one of your desired pH. And that will allow you to um, basically figure out, you know, what's a good combination. As we'll talk about in lab as well, you could also use the henderson hasselbach equation to figure out how much of each of those things that you need to weigh out. Uh, but we'll get into that as well. Any questions on any of that there? All right, questions on how a buffer works or anything like that. All right, then uh, let's take a look key here. We did that there. All right. Uh, yes, so uh, here's just a graph of what we've been talking about. Obviously in a buffer solution, uh, it's able to maintain that pH, uh, even when you add acid or base to it. In this case, we're adding acid. And as you can clearly see, just the addition of a little bit of acid in a non-buffer situation, we have a pretty big drop in the pH. And again, pretty far drop as opposed to maintaining it. All right, so take a moment here. Which of the following would make a buffer system or you could make a buffer out of? Okay, uh, so remember here, we're looking really for a combination here of a weak acid and its conjugate base or a weak base and its conjugate acid. And ultimately the difference there between those two should be just an H plus. So that will help us perhaps determine it. So if we look at A here, uh, we got uh, KF and HF. HF, as we just looked at, is a weak acid. And this is his conjugate base. Remember that this is K plus and F minus, and it really is that F minus part that is the conjugate base part here. Uh, so that definitely would be a buffer. Yeah, so you can make a buffer out of that. Question on that one there. 
we got uh, B here, which is like HBR, which is an acid. And this is KBR, which is K plus and BR minus. So BR minus and HBR, they are related to each other. That would be sort of like his conjugate base. Can this be a buffer? It cannot because this acid is a strong acid, yeah. That's a strong acid, which means this cannot be a buffer. So even though they are related to each other, uh, that strong acid is just going to completely break apart and will not be able to set up that equilibrium that is necessary. Then we got a little bicarbonate buffer, basically, and carbonate. These two are obviously related to each other. In this case, the sodiums are just spectator ions. They're not doing much, right? So the buffer part would be these two. Buffer? It is. This would be sort of a weak acid and it's conjugate base, kind of like in your body. Base. There you go. Um, this really comes from carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. So obviously these guys would be weak as well and our conjugate base, with obviously this being our acid part of the buffer, right? And this being our base part of the buffer. So this would be a buffer. Any questions on any of those there? All right, let's take a look at some calculations here. Let's start with the first part here. Calculate the pH of a buffer that contains one molar acetic acid and one molar sodium acetate. Uh, and then we'll talk about B in just a second here together. So why don't you start with A, the Ka value for acetic acid, 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. Let's see what you come up with here. Okay, let's take a look at this. So first thing you should recognize hopefully is uh, these two things are related to each other, right? Uh, so these two things are related. Uh, we do have a Ka value. So I do know this is a weak acid. And this would be as conjugate base. And that automatically should tell you this is like a buffer situation. Even if the problem didn't tell you, you know, this is basically a buffer situation. So because of that, we really do have sort of two options as we talked about. You could do an ice table or you could do just the Henderson-Hasselbach equation at this point. And that is probably my choice here. What I'm going to do is the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. And that means we do need to use our Ka value here to get to the pKa. So our pKa would equal minus the log of the Ka value. That is minus the log of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 equals 4.74. Now we can go into here. Our pH would equal 4.74 plus the log. The base in this case, again, is our sodium acetate, although you can't really go too wrong in this problem as they are both one molar in terms of their concentrations. Once again, that's going to give me the log of 1 on the back end there, and that's going to equal 0. And that means that in this case, our pH here would be 4.74. Any questions on that? Now, if you chose to do an ice table instead, you would go with probably the weak acid dissociating into H plus and acetate. And you would do your initial concentration here of one. This would be zero. And as we've been talking about, really important, you do need that initial concentration of one there. Change would be minus X uh, plus X plus X. And that would get you one minus X, X, and one plus X. This obviously would go into our Ka. You would get your X value. That X value would equal the H plus concentration. And then you go into the pH, which should get you back over here uh, when it's all said and done. So again, if you wanted to use the ice table approach, you could without the henderson hasselbach It is your choice. When you do use the henderson hasselbach it's a good idea to have it in molarity. But just so you know, um, this is the one place, if you do the henderson hasselbach not the ice table, but if you do the henderson hasselbach in a situation that is a buffer, uh, 
uh, you can do those guys in moles and it will come out okay. And that's because the volume on top and the volume on the bottom cancel each other out when you're using the henderson osbach equation, not when you're doing um, the ice table. So you do need molarity usually for an ice table, um, but you can use moles in there if you needed to. Any question on that there? <clears throat> So this would be our buffer at 4.74. So now we're going to look at uh, B here and see uh, what's going to happen to this same buffer. So we're going to take the same buffer that we had there in part A, but to it, we're going to add some HCl to it. Now, we're going to assume in this particular problem, just to kind of keep the numbers not too bad, just to demonstrate this calculation, uh, we're going to assume that everybody's volume is just going to be one liter. So the volume is going to kind of stay the same, not change. That is not always the case. You do have to take the volume into consideration in a lot of cases, but just for this first calculation here, uh, we're gonna assume that everybody's volume is one liter and nothing's really changing. So in part B, we're going to take our same exact buffer of one molar acetic acid and uh, one molar sodium acetate. And because it's really the same buffer, the same weak acid, it has the same Ka value of 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. We are going to add to it with 0 0.1 molar HCl. And again here, just in this example, we're going to keep everybody's volume at uh, one liter. All right. So this is the first sort of really big idea that you got to remember, which is this question. When I add volume, so when I add a volume of one solution to a volume of another and I put them together, does their molarity stay the same? So if I had like a 0.1 molar solution of something and a 0.2 molar solution and I pour them together, are their molarity still 0.1 and 0.2 when they come together? They're not, as we talked about, we basically just did a dilution, right? So molarity always changes when you add really volume to the situation. And that is because molarity really is moles of the solute per liter of solution. So as you keep adding more solution, you're changing the molarity because that bottom number is constantly changing. The one number though that is not changing is the top number, which is the moles of the solute. So whenever you have a situation where you're adding volume to another volume and you need to do an ice table, you need to do that ice table in moles because the moles will stay the same and the molarity will keep changing. It is really the moles of the solute when you have it in a solution that's reacting. And that's really the stuff that's reacting is the moles that's in there of those solute particles flying around that's really reacting. So you should always do it in moles when you do an ice table, when you're adding volume. It happens here in buffers where we have a buffer and then we add a certain volume of acid or base to it. It happens nonstop as we'll talk about when we get to titrations. All you are constantly doing in a titration, right, is adding volume, right? So molarity is constantly changing but the moles stay the same. There's only a, a finite amount of moles that's in your solution to react. So once you do the first ice table in moles, you should always convert it back to molarity at the end using the total volume. The total volume would be like the volume of your buffer in this case and the volume of acid you added or the volume of base that you added to your buffer. Uh, you wanna always divide it back and get it back to molarity. So in this particular case here, we're going to add some HCl to our buffer. So we are going to get a reaction here and our HCl will react with which part of this buffer? The acetic acid or the sodium acetate? It will react with the base part of the buffer, which is this guy, right? This is the acid part of the buffer. And that's the base part. So HCl will react with some sodium acetate and we will get a double displacement reaction happening. So remember that you always make the other part of the buffer, which in this case is acetic acid. So you actually have the answer kind of there. And we will make some sodium chloride in this case. So that is the reaction that is going to occur when we mix these guys together. <clears throat> 
Now, we do need to figure out what just happened to our buffer here. So we are going to add this again to an ice table and we're going to use moles. So for our HCL, if I have one liter and I have a molarity of 0 0.1 moles per liter, we will end up with 0 0.1 moles of HCL. So this is going to be 0.1 mole. Our sodium acetate would also be one liter times one, which is one mole. And the important part here, once again, is if we do not put a number here, it is not a buffer. So because we do have obviously acetic acid in the solution to begin with, one liter times one would be one molar here. Change part now. By the way, why did I ignore sodium chloride? It is a salt, and what type of salt is it? Yeah, so why put numbers you were gonna use wrong, right? So just leave it alone, don't do anything there. Now, if this is a properly functioning buffer, which I hope it is, otherwise we're in trouble, what should happen to that HCL in this case? Should it still be there? Should it get used up? What should happen? It should get used up. That's the idea of the buffer, right? And if we think about it sort of as like limiting reagent, excess reagent, our sodium acetate in this case is definitely the excess reagent. We got one mole of it, and this guy is the limiting reagent. The change part here is actually going to be a number. It's not going to be X because we know what should happen here. And what should happen is all of that HCL that we added should get used up. By the way, logic also tells us that can we have a negative concentration of moles? The answer is no. So you should always take the smaller number in this situation, yeah? Otherwise you get a negative and that's not good. That means that when we reach equilibrium here, as we should hopefully expect, all of the HCL we added should get used up. We then will have 0 0.9 moles of our sodium acetate, and we will have 1.1 moles of our acetic acid. Remember, we are adding on the right-hand side. They're not subtracting. At this point, what we want to do is now convert these things back into molarity, and we would use the total volume in this case. In this case, we're just going to use one liter, but normally you would take the volume of your buffer that you started with, and in this case, the volume of the acid that you added, and that would get you your total volume, most likely in milliliters. You would have to convert it to liters. But to keep everything a little bit simpler here in this calculation, we're going to assume one liter. So we're going to divide everybody by one liter. That gives us 1.1 molar and 0 0.9 molar here. First off, any questions on the ice table here? Now, it's really important if you're not sure what's going on at this point to use your ice table to help you. You should be able to look at your ice table at this point and see uh, you have this guy right here still left and you have this guy right here still left. That is acetic acid and sodium acetate. These two things are still what type of solution? That is still a buffer at this point, yeah? You still have a weak acid and its conjugate base left over, which means because I still have a buffer left over at this point, the way I can calculate the pH of the buffer is to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, yeah? You could also do an ice table if you wanted to. That's your other option here, but I'm going to do a Henderson-Hasselbalch, and I could go into my Henderson-Hasselbalch equation now, it will obviously be the same pKa value that we used previously, which was not three, not 4.74, plus the log. The important part here is the base. And again, it is the sodium acetate that is the base. So that's going to be 0.9 up on top divided by our acid, which is 1.1. We're going to divide that first, 0.9, divided by 1.1, then take the log of it and then add it to 4.74, and that's going to give us a 
you once again can also do an ice table using these concentrations here at equilibrium as your initial concentrations in the ice table if you just do it. First off, any questions on that there? Did our buffer do a good job in this case? It did. We started with a buffer at 4.74. We added some acid to it. It is at a 4.65, which is essentially in the same ballpark. But the way you can also check that you didn't screw up on some of the calculation is, did it go in the correct direction? Even though it did move a little bit, did it move in the right way? The answer is yes, because we added acid, which means we would expect the pH to come down, right? So if you did this calculation, you ended up with like 4.84, although it did went on a little bit, it went in the wrong direction if you added acid, right? Now, if we added base, we might expect it to go up. But so it's a way you want to look at your answer to make sure it makes sense. If you're adding acid, you should see it come down a little bit. If you're adding base, it should come up a little bit. You should hopefully not see really big jumps in pH unless it's really not a great buffer, right? You might see it, but you really shouldn't see it. Any questions on that there? Now, to illustrate what we were talking about earlier, that you know there is a limit to buffer capacity. Maybe I'll do it uh, here. Um, let's just take this same buffer here, and let's say we have our HCl that we're going to add. And we have our, obviously, uh, sodium acetate. And that will make our acetic acid. And our sodium chloride here in this case. So we're going to take our same uh, one molar acetic acid buffer that we were just doing and our one molar sodium acetate buffer that we were just using. And let's just say, for example, uh, you know, you went to go grab the 0.1 molar HCl, but, you know, you did grab perhaps the 18 molar HCl instead. Whoops. I guess that happened. And you decide, well, it has a one in it. How bad could it be? Let's just add it. So initially here, we're obviously going to have our one mole of our acetate and our one mole of our acetic acid. And if we added one liter, a lot. We had one liter here of our 18 molar HCl. That would give us how many moles? About 18 moles of HCl that we just added to the solution, right? <laughs> Probably be screaming at you at this point. I don't know, but you'd be going, well, my beaker is like super hot. Hopefully you're not holding it. All right. So at this point, what's going to happen? Which one's like the limiting reagent in this case? Yeah, we kind of would have a major switch that would happen, right? We have not nowhere near enough of the sodium acetate to handle all that acid we just dumped in there. And this would be the excess reagent, which means the change actually would be the sodium acetate in this case. And that would get us about 17 moles of that guy, a little bit more reasonable, zero of that guy. And uh, you know, have like two moles of this guy which obviously we can convert back into molarity at this point. First things first here, do we still have a buffer at this point? Are these two things a buffer? Those two things are not a buffer, right? So we no longer have a buffer at this point. We basically have this guy, which we know is a weak acid, right? And we basically have this guy, which is a strong acid, right? And out of the two is clearly going to be that HCl that's going to contribute all of those H pluses to the solution, right? And this guy is also going to contribute a little bit of H plus to the, the party as well. And now what we just did here is basically we just blew through our buffer, right? Because we didn't have enough of the base part of our buffer to handle that much of the HCl that was coming in. So we definitely, this is why we would see a really big jump in pH at this point because we basically blew through the buffer capacity in this case. Any questions on that? Yeah. It's, it's not necessarily just a buffer. It very commonly happens in a buffer situation where you have a buffer and you're adding some type of volume to it, like an acid or base to it. You would need to convert to moles. We wouldn't need to do that if we did an ice table for just the buffer by itself because we didn't add anything to it.
And the other common place where we will see this shortly in this chapter is when we do titrations. Because titrations, you're doing nothing but that, but adding volume. So it constantly changes the molarity. But as you can see here, it is really the moles of your solute that's in those solutions. That's really what's reacting. So that is really the important part of it. And uh, that's why we do the dice table moles, but then want to convert it back to molarity. The reason why it's really good practice at the end of this table here to convert it back to molarity is usually the next part of the calculation. If you need to do another part, which a lot of times you do, uh, it needs molarity to be in molarity. So you're in the right units. All right. Uh, so we got that, that, that. All right. So let's do we did that one. Why don't you try one here? We got calculate the pH of this buffer made up of ammonia and ammonium chloride. And what it would be the pH after you add 20 milliliters of 0 0.05 molar sodium hydroxide to it. Uh, 80 mils of this buffer. So in this problem, we're not keeping the volumes constant. So you do need to take the volumes of each of these things into account. And the Ka value here for NH4 plus 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. We're looking for two answers. Uh, one, uh, what is the pH of the buffer by itself? And then what is the pH after you add 20 mils of sodium hydroxide to that buffer? Look, since we're getting to the end here, uh, so we're looking for two answers, uh, what the pH of the buffer was before. Once again, if it didn't tell you it was a buffer, you should hopefully be able to see the relationship between those two things uh, with the NH4 plus really being the other part of the buffer uh, that's with the NH3. So we really have really here an NH3, NH4 plus sort of buffer happening. Again, the chloride here, just a spectator ion. It's not really doing much other than floating around having a good time. Uh, because we can recognize this as a buffer, we can go right into our henderson hasselbach equation. Uh, we could use our concentrations because frankly, we haven't added anything to it yet to start with. Our pKa value here would be minus the log of our 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. And that should be our 9.25, I believe. And that is a uh, 9.25. That gives us uh, 9.25 plus the log. Again, here, the acid, we usually will have one more hydrogen. So that's the NH4 plus part. And that means 0 0.36 is the acid, which should not go up on top. It should be the base that should go up there. And jump the gun. There we go. Uh, we want the base, which would be the 0.3 up on top. And our acid here on the bottom. That gives us uh, 0.3 divided by 0.36. Uh, take the log of it and then add it to 925. Gives us about a 9.17 as sort of the opening pH here of our buffer. Any questions on that there? This is obviously a basic buffer. henderson Osbach works just fine with it, as you can see. Again, you could use the POH version if you wanted to uh, with the PKB value, but uh, this is just as easy, I think. Now we are actually going to do the second part, which is we are going to be adding some sodium hydroxide to this buffer. So when I add the sodium hydroxide to this buffer, it is going to react with the acid part of the buffer, which again is the one with more hydrogens. That is that guy. And if you wanna keep the chloride in, you can, or if you wanna take it out, you can as well, whatever you like to do. That is gonna give me a little bit of a few things going to happen. In this case, we're going to make some water. We're going to make some NH3. And I uh, got a little sodium chloride all left over when it's all said and done in this case. We need to do this table in moles because we're adding obviously volume to volume in this case. So we got to convert everybody to moles. In this case, uh, we're using 20 milliliters of 0 0.05 molar sodium hydroxide. So we'll take our 20 milliliters, convert it to liters times it by the molarity of our sodium hydroxide, 0.05 moles per liter. 
And that gives us for our sodium hydroxide here, 0 0.020 times 0 0.05. Looks like uh, 0 0.001 moles of sodium hydroxide. So that is initially what we want to use here. We want to do the same thing for our buffer. So in this case, it is 80 milliliters of our buffer. And in that 80 milliliters, we have NH3 and we have NH4 plus floating around in the same beaker. So we would take 0 0.08, which is the volume of the buffer, times it by the molarity of our NH4 plus, which is 0.36. And that will give us for moles of this guy, 0 0.0288 moles. Water, I'm not going to worry about, right? Because I won't put X, we won't worry about it. Uh, NH3, we will also 0 0.08 because it's part of the buffer times 0.3. Remember, if we do not have a number here, we are not doing a buffer problem, right? And the sodium chloride here, I'm not going to worry about either. So neither one of these are going to affect the pH. So I'm not going to do anything with any numbers or anything in those columns that I might use incorrectly last time. Any questions on that so far? The change part here should be the sodium hydroxide we're adding, right? Because this is a buffer. It is a smaller number. So we should have 0 0.001 minus 0 0.001 and plus 0 0.001. That is going to get us at equilibrium here. All of our sodium hydroxide should be gone. 0 0.0288 minus 0 0.001 gets us 0 0.0278 moles, 0 0.0240 plus 0 0.001 gets us 0 0.0250 oops, moles. Any questions up to there? You should convert back to molarity here. So we want the total volume in this case. We have 80 milliliters of the buffer we started with, and we added 20 milliliters to it. Total volume in this case is 100 milliliters, or 0 0.1 liter, right? So that is our total volume. So we'll divide this guy by the total volume to convert it back into molarity, and we'll divide this guy by the total volume to convert it back to molarity. That gets us... Uh, 0 0.25 molar, and over here, 0 0.278 molar. Any questions on that so far? Now, if you're not sure what's going on, you could use your ice table. We still have NH3 left over. We still have ammonium chloride left over. And once again, those two things are still a buffer which means because it's still a buffer, this ice table basically just told us how our buffer changed. We could go back into our Henderson-Hasselbalch equation using the same pKa value plus the log. Again, we want to get the base up on top, 9.20.